So are you ready? Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Mark, this is David, Kieran, and Nathan. Uh, and our project is sort of cutely, tentatively titled Grapevine, um, topic, detention, topic Detection and Prediction Using Twitter. Um, so to give you guys kind of an overview of what this is, uh, if you're looking at something like Twitter and you start just pulling up Twitter and seeing what comes through, you might see stuff like this, right? But it's coming about Sony, something about cameras with Sony, some tablet, right? This might be if you sample Twitter uh, right around the time that CES was happening. And so the goal of our project really is given past information about what people were talking about, can you kind of detect the topics that they're referring to and then predict future topics? So I mean, you've seen this in a bunch of other presentations that have been presented. Um, so this isn't necessarily anything new. Um, but what makes our approach, I think, different than a lot of the other stuff that's been presented here today, as well as what's in the literature, is that we're kind of focusing on the intersection between that and community detection. Um, so to kind of give you an idea of what we mean by community detection, uh, let's start with an example. So let's say we go into Twitter and we search for our favorite Canadian pop star, Justin Bieber, on Twitter. Uh, we're going to see essentially a couple of different camps, right? You're going to see a couple of tweets like this. Really excited about the new concept. Album's coming out. I can't wait to go. And then a whole bunch of other people who just can't wait for him to get off Twitter, right? And so standard topic modeling approaches, if you were to take this approach to try and model the Bieber topic, you get kind of a muddied approach, right? Um, our hypothesis is that by breaking up these into essentially two separate communities, people who all sort of talk together about the same thing, you can actually get better prediction uh, of those words as a result of that, right? So we'd expect that if we were to break it out now and do this thing as two separate things, you know, you think you predict things about the cost of the album and maybe less positive things in the other camp, right? Um, okay, so <clears throat> why would you care about this? So let's take, for example, a set of tweets, right? If we, if you're able, say you're able to predict this sort of future word distribution, what does that buy you? Why do I care? Well, let's say I'm Amazon, right? And I, you know, Bieber is coming out, I mean, I probably know that he's coming out with an album, but let's say there's a, a lot of excitement. I actually might want to price my ads differently for Justin Bieber on, uh, on Amazon and maybe recommend products differently on Amazon based on what people are kind of talking about. Similarly, if I'm Amazon, I might be trying to predict how many albums, Justin Bieber albums, people might be trying to predict. Right? This is a, called supply forecasting. And it's another um, instance of where if you have prior information uh, that could lead you, that could give you uh, a better sense of how much future demand there might be for a product or a service, you can scale that demand accordingly. Uh, if I'm say, Yahoo or Google and I'm trying to you know, get um, load balancing on my servers for this, I might be able to use this information to do more predictive load balancing as opposed to reactive load balancing, right? Um, similarly to the finance data, you know, if, if for some reason Bieber, you know, I don't know if he has his own record company or if he works for a record company, if I you know, knew that this was going to be a really popular album, everyone's loving the album, that might give me an indication of how that company might do. Uh, and <laughs> if there actually was a theoretical Bieber fever that one could contract amongst my social groups, if I knew that everyone was contracting this Bieber fever, I might be able to dispatch the appropriate medical aid to the right groups. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this worked much better for like polio or something. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but here again is an example where you can kind of use the social communities as, an exa as you know, one potential way where having community detection is actually useful in this context. Right? So let's again put our work in context of other work. Uh, so there's topic models, right? We've seen that. There's been a lot of uh, work in that area. Uh, but then there's also community detection, right? And so we're kind of sitting in the middle of this where we're essentially trying to use communities as almost like a prior or some sort of separation uh, on a, a class of topic models. So essentially conditioning on communities, can we get more descriptive topic models as a result, right? So things like, you know, online LDA, you know, Alex has a bunch of papers on this, right? We've talked about, you know, different groups of kind of um, talk, you know, about how you can do topic models efficiently. Um, community detection, there's a couple of models that address that as well. There's even been some papers that have tried to address both. Uh, however, they've really only d done it for things like, you know, research citations, so looking at citation networks, um, or blogs, like, you know, pay basically page rank plus topic models. Um, but nothing that really looks at sort of the social structure or, um, Really, none of these really address scalability in any sense, and they also don't really um, look at sort of microblogs as a platform, sort of social media and how that factors in. So we're essentially going to take this intermediate thing here, but add on scalability and microblogging to that. So that's essentially our value proposition. 
Um, okay, so timeline. So this is from the beginning of the course to the end of the course, you know, here we are approximately now. <laughs> During this time, we've accumulated one, this 1% 1 should, I guess, correlate to the amount of data we have, not necessarily <laughs> in, so proportional. Um, but yeah, so we've been collecting 1% of the Twitter data stream since the beginning of the class. Um, and from this, we've already started looking at the kind of graph information and communities that we can get from this, right? So of this, we found about 450 subgraphs of Twitter that have more than 20 members, but it's an extremely long tail distribution, uh, given what we had. We expect that this will sort of develop over time. So as we get towards the end of the course, we also have the same um, garden hose stream that the other class has, that, we, that has also been collecting since, you know, I forget when they started. Uh, but we have that, so we're kind of saving that data till the end. So we're doing all of our model development, essentially, on the 1%, the 1% uh, and then testing it on the sort of the final 10%, being able to use that as part of the trend for more later. Um, so hopefully over time this graph will get a little bit more dense, we'll be able to uh, draw better conclusions about that. Um, and so our rough basic steps are model and algorithm development in the near future on the 1% of the data, testing scalability using the garden, scaling up to garden hose level, and then doing predictive tests against incoming data. So this is similar to what previous groups have said where, you know, you have some future work, you know, if these are a series of tweets in the past and I'm trying to predict what people are talking about in the future, uh, looking at differences in the distribution of words, um, expect to that. So there's a bunch of metrics that people have, have used to evaluate that. Um, so that's essentially it, what we had to present to you guys. We have additional results that we could show you, but we wanted to stop here because we weren't sure how much time we'd have. So you know, we, any feedback you guys have for us would be appreciated. Okay, so.